Live from the Fairmont Hotel in San Jose, California, it's The Cube at Big Data SV 2015. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are here live in Silicon Valley for Big Data SV, it's part of Strata Conference, Hadoop World. Big Data Week here in Silicon Valley and all the actions happening here inside the Cube and out around in the facilities here at Convention Center. This is the Cube, our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier. My co-host this week is Jeff Kelly, Big Data Analyst at Wikibon. Our next guest is Chris Poulin, Principal Partner, Patterns and Predictions. Uh, welcome to the Cube, Big Data Week. Predictions, patterns, what are you seeing? <laughs> the <laughs> analytics are huge. The killer app again this year is analytics. Right, um, right. But interesting dynamics are changing. Obviously the market's evolving. Um, you know, we've always been talking on theCUBE, you know, even three years ago, Ping Lee, who was on our panel last night from Excel Partners and Mike Olson, this is the year of apps and we got a hundred million dollar fund. Just never happened. And analytics was really the killer app for the first few years mm. of big data because it was easy and that's the market was growing underneath. Now integrating into applications is a big topic, and machine learning is now front and center, it's native, people are moving it out of the academic into mainstream. So what's your take on all this? I mean, the, the, the computer science, the algorithms are all here. What's the state of the union that you're seeing, some of the patterns that you're seeing happening this week? Well, I, I mean, I think that one of the topics that's been brought up in earlier segments has been sort of solving a problem for business, right? And so that's, that sounds like some sort of trivial speak or some sort of marketing uh, <laughs> pitch, but ultimately it's a really practical problem, which is that uh, for all of our successful projects, whether it's been military mental health or financial prediction or you know, any other application of big data, ultimately we've solved the problem by labeling what is, you know, defining what the problem is mm -hmm. and then optimizing the solution towards solving that problem. So the reason I say all of that in abstract terms, the, the practical terms mean that you, you need to solve a specific problem and then you need to find all of the big data tools to get you to solve that problem. Mm -hmm. And then I think the final point to answer your question directly is, you know, why haven't we seen sort of the explosion of analytics is because people have been more focused on the tools and the cool whiz bang things you can do and how fast you can do the runtime and how fast you can solve the problem, maybe what your accuracy rates are. Uh, in fact, last year I think you saw a consolidation of a lot of machine learning shops like DeepMind and, and people that compete with us. And really the benchmark for their success revolved around you know, the, the stellar accuracy levels and the sort of unstructured and unsupervised learning that they were able to uh, demonstrate that maybe Google wasn't even Google wasn't uh, demonstrating by itself. So, so the, that, that is the answer in that people are not solving big enough problems uh, and they're just sort of you know, adding some sort of runtime optimization or uh, data lakeification to the you know, standard customer data service. Data lakeification. <laughs> <laughs> Love <laughs> that term data lake, man. I got to get data ocean in there. That's right. I got to make that a standard just by saying it. No, but so let's get to data science, because data science, how Obama's up there, you got to now, uh, one right. of the industry, our industry's own is a chief data scientist in the government. Huge new changes in the government. Let's bring the visibility of the data science. You're, this is your world. Right. This, is, this is the community. What is, is it rock star status in your mind right now for data science? Are you seeing that? Is that just a promotional thing or do you see that swell really coming mainstream on data science? Or is that a gimmick by the, by the Obama administration trying to be cool? Well, no, I mean, I think that we are at, an, at a, we're somewhere in an inflection point. I mean, I have this, this own mental question. From an HR perspective, it's very hard to hire data scientists, I can tell you, <laughs> and, and you know, people that have, it's not hard to train sort of uh, low-level data scientists, especially with all the analytical tools I was just talking about and all the new whiz-bang things that are coming out in the past two years, but people that have sort of seen that tried and true workflow and sort of know the pitfalls and know how to deploy uh, statistical analysis at scale and then not just at scale, but in a way that dashboards so that the executives and the people that are stakeholders and the people that write the checks can actually buy into it. So um, that's sort of where I see data science from a, from a you know, data science leader perspective. From a purely scientific perspective, I do think we're at an inflection point, which, and so does Google, right, with this DeepMind acquisition, where you are seeing human-like performance in a lot of these automated systems. And since you are seeing human-like performance in modalities that 
that up till now, you know, humans have dominated in, you are seeing a true emergence of automation on, you know, classical big, no, I guess I'm saying classical big data, like it's, uh, <laughs> like, <laughs> hey, you know, four years ago, yeah, yeah, all, old you know, school, way classic back, rock, you know, come on, yeah. 60s, yeah, the well, machine learning's been around for the 60s, so we, you know, sure, that's, sure. Yeah, that's classic, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, well, why don't we take a step back? Tell us a little bit about patterns predictions, because it's an interesting story, kind of how, how you guys got your start and some of the, the early uh, work you've done um, with the Durkheim project. Yeah, so patterns and predictions uh, was actually started uh, in collaboration with uh, a Danish analytics firm or a, a you know, Bayesian mathematics firm. Uh, about Twelve years ago, we started out, and our idea was sort of to create like a SaaS light, like a like a open tool that was a reduced complexity uh, uh, library that people could use to then you know do predictive analytics. And pretty quickly we realized that uh, one, of our, one of our niche points was, was sort of unstructured data and mm -hmm. you know, processing different data types. And again, this was sort of 10 years ago, and so back then I was sounding very crazy. Yeah, I bet you got a lot of strange <laughs> looks back 10 years ago talking right, about this I was this sort stuff. of pitching like, oh, it's unstructured <laughs> data, don't you get it? And, you know, Sergey Brin you know, just said this. And, you know, <laughs> so, so, <laughs> yeah, so people Funny just... Funny farm. Say, <laughs> exactly. So people just jacket. thought that I was strange. But, and that may be true, but so the uh, so no, you got to be crazy to be in big data, you know, yeah, crazy. So th so th so we had this, you know, SaaS light, if you will. That's sort of uh, I think Josh Wills from Cloudera called it that. So so there's you know SaaS light, and then you know an unstructured workflow on top of that. And pretty quickly we realized, oh no, when you when you have all of this data, we can't run it all in a bigger quad Xeon with more and more RAM. So we literally, you know, this was this was early 2000s. We realized well, we have a problem here. So we went to the supercomputing community and mm -hmm. we made inroads with a lot of academic institutions to build up a custom MPI layer that we could then you know, manage our services on because ultimately for us it's complexity management in the stack. So we built this, we built this you know, really ugly MPI architecture that worked but it would you know, sort of drop things. And, you know, and, and life was sort of hair pulling but we had this cool, you know, fully distributed, unstructured, event driven platform that, you know, just well, throw platform in there, so, <laughs> you know, and, and it would, and it would, you know, do what we wanted it to do in terms of predictive analytics. And then sort of, you know, there's a lot of things in parallel that heated up, but right around somewhere in the late 2000s, uh, I found out about Hadoop. And I don't think Cloud Air had been started yet or it was in the process of getting started. Mm -hmm. So I reached out to Doug and I reached out to, you know, you know mm -hmm. indirectly had reached out to Doug and Amr at Cloud Air and, you know, sort of through um, another guy uh, who's now at MapR, Ted Dunning, and I mm -hmm. were working on, you know, distributed systems, distributed, you know, trying to, trying to meld machine learning and Hadoop. Right, uh, and it was sort of again, you know, this is now two thousand. Well, I was going to say, yeah, this still, still crazy, this right? Is, yeah, this yeah. is five still years ago, pretty right? early. Yeah. yeah, four or five years ago. So that was the, the the idea was not again going back to you know sort of how I rambled in my opening was that this wasn't because I thought it was a cool project. It was a cool project, but be, but we literally had to have this answer of how fast can we compute on a reduced infrastructure, you know, complexity infrastructure and cost, and also how accurately could we, you know, what algorithms could we use, and we had very specific algorithm implementations we wanted to do. So, so that's how we, I sort of got involved with all of the Hadoop guys, and uh, I was actually MapR's first customer, and, you know, before they were in beta, I, I got their first license. You know, and yeah. so I've got. Did Shrevis get involved? He was involved. Yeah, yep. he was involved. He was Good. involved. And uh, awesome. I don't know if John has that check, but uh, <laughs> but you know, mounted so, on his wall. Yeah. So so we're just trying to build up sort of a capability. What and was the magnified learnings you got out of that? Was there anything that you could? Because you were in a point of time where cutting edge vision of what people want to do now. You were doing it early, but there was some infrastructure things that you that were happening around you that were still developing. So you were probably you know dealing with that in real time. Uh, what was the key learnings you, that you uh, got out of that that were magnified for you guys at that stage that, you, that could be applied today? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, the, again, sort of back to these high level, you know, um, goalposts, <coughs> for a lot of this infrastructure, and I'm, I'm sure that, you know, I'm not the first person to say this, that the, that the stack is complicated, it's, com it's complex. You know, I think, you know, Jeff talked about it last night, you know, in, in terms of your speech, that, you know, ultimately it's a, a complex stack, but there's a lot of moving parts. And so, 
So, you know, you could say, well, throw more bodies at it, right? Mm -hmm. Which is a lot of what large companies have been doing. And you've heard from your other interviewees that that's not always going well because of yeah. sort of this institutional knowledge of propagation is, yeah. is a problem. Because if one guy, you know, it's the classic thing where the, the one guy who doesn't bathe knows how the stack works, but then <laughs> the institution doesn't, you know, it's real, doesn't really propagate. So, so with, uh, you know, with Cloudera, which is, you know, I'm, I'm excited that they're doing great. They, they were keep, kept building more and more tools. They weren't the only ones, so obviously they were responding to pressure in the well, market. They were first to, movers, so they had a green field. Exactly. And now competition comes in. And, and the competition was building newer and newer tools, and Storm came out, and you know, and obviously Spark. And so there's obviously other. Do you think there's an us against them mentality with Cloudera? I mean, Cloudera was first, and they were the pioneers, right? But now there's obviously some tension between this new open data platform and what uh, Mike Olson's blog blog post talked about essentially saying, hey, you know, it's never going to work, it's ridiculous. Essentially, I'm paraphrasing, he didn't say that word, but that's basically what he was saying. And, um, you know, stay with us, it was almost like, you know, Cloudera has the right model. Um, caused some confusion, what's your take on that? I mean, is it? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's just a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a logical strategic move for these guys in the sense that, that Cloudera was first mover. They have it's got to move for those other guys to the consortium. Right, yeah. it, it, that Cloudera was the first mover. They just raised a lot of money, and so they're you know in a good position, and so the other guys are in good positions as well. But they're, but separate in a separate capacity, they're not quite as strong. So it's a yeah, loosely alliance. coupled. If they come yeah, together, it's gravity, yeah, and they so can it, accelerate. I'm sure the cloud air guys are not happy about the newest thing from from multiple reasons. <laughs> yeah, yeah. More muscle. I mean, it's like a gang right, gang right. up almost. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, so talk about you mentioned you know solving problems. That's uh, ultimately that's what this is about, right? It's, right. About, it's not about you know how fast can you platform run or, or what, what cool algorithms can you run? It's about how do you solve a problem, right? So I, it, we, I know from you know, having uh, chatted with you a little bit about the Durkheim project, talk a little bit about that, because um, that's pretty compelling. I mean, that's solving a, a pretty, pretty well, compelling problem. So talk a little bit about that project and maybe what you learned there and how you can apply some of those lessons to solving other business problems. Absolutely. So, so, you know, in sort of answering the earlier questions, I, I, I kind of brought you guys up to about 2009 or so, <laughs> 2010. We got another and, hour, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and at that point, the Joint Chiefs of Staff sent a representative to Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center mm -hmm. looking for solutions on real-time prediction of suicide risk for military veterans and other mental health, PTSD, diagnoses, that sort of thing. And so, with my affiliation through Dartmouth, I was contacted to sort of build a consortium to come up with a solution to this particular problem. Now, we responded back that... And it was a pretty big problem. This was happening, all, like there was some serious numbers of, of suicides with veterans. Correct, and unfortunately, yeah. they, they've only abated slightly, if, if any. Mm -hmm. so, so I put together a team, uh, including Cloudera. Uh, it was led by you know, my small group patterns and predictions the uh, founding uh, research members were Cloudera for distributed infrastructure and Dartmouth Hitchcock uh, Medical Center, you know, Dartmouth mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. uh, you know, medical curation and, and adding the, the, the physicians, yeah. right. And so we actually proposed to DARPA a more of a social networks and mobile media driven architecture. And we, you know, spent their money and we <laughs> developed, uh, further, further developed the platform that, mm -hmm. that it sort of had been referring to. And that's sort of our, our most visible use case is the Durkheim project in terms of solving a real problem, which is specifically in, real, in near real time, to be exact, in, in a 30 second real time label, what is the risk for any number of individuals of suicide risk based on, based on this you know, machine learning training data that we did with the, with the Veterans Administration, which was a sort of a later, uh, later team member. The uh, marquee team member that actually did the press for us and the distribution was Facebook, in, you know, Facebook Inc. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, actually got up there and, and uh, pitched with them. So we solved a real problem with the Durkheim project using big data, all the bells and whistles. All right. And now, but now the job is now how do we apply that to what, what's it going to take to move this beyond uh, from from back to the big data question? Move it beyond talking about infrastructure and to some extent analytics, but to actually applications and solving a problem. Um, such as you did in that case. What do you think it's going to take to do that you know, at scale for the industry? Well, so this goes back to your point of last night about data governance, that 
the, the key challenge now is social engineering, not technology. Now we have the technology, right? Mm -hmm. we, ha we have it. <laughs> and, you know, it, it was $2 million, not $6 million, but the point is we, <laughs> we now have this technology. It is effective, it works, it impresses the heck out of the psychologists at the Veterans Administration. That gets the renewal. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> the, the grant the, comes the, in. You know, but, the, but the key thing is what does that intervention look like? What is yeah. the, you know, your, your right. big data needs to be grounded on some sort of social impact and some sort of, you know, pro proscriptive or prescriptive mm -hmm. uh, scenario that, that makes sense from a, from a data governance perspective, from mm -hmm. a social engineering perspective, and from a compliance perspective. Mm -hmm. Chris, we got to get wrapped up. We're getting the hook here, but I want to get you um, the final word. What is your take on where we are now? And quickly share with the folks out there what's going on right now. What's, what do you see happening? And, and, and what should people be looking at that, that isn't being talked about right now in this industry that's important? So uh, I think that you're going to see some reasonably, uh, some reasonable upheaval in the next couple of years as people start to automate more and more systems. So, you know, uh, an interesting news item was when the Uber CEO was talking about how he wants to get into self-driving cars as well because now that's, that's sort of the new hot thing is for people to throw billions of dollars into self-driving cars. Well, and drones are now you know, permissive uh, everywhere. Now the U.S. Department uh, of Defense has authorized drones to be sold, armed drones to be sold to other governments. So you are seeing a tremendous amount of automation of daily lives and th these things may or may not be scary. So you're the seeing- The word geospatial means something now, doesn't it? Absolutely. And so <laughs> you're just, you're see, but you're seeing, you're seeing a lot of uh, what I like to call existential risks <laughs> <laughs> to it, individuals, their, their you know, privacy, their freedom, and potentially their lives. So, you know, you, that's why I try to build white hat big data systems, <laughs> I guess, if you. Well, this is great stuff. I love this stuff. I can go another hour. These guys uh, uh, want to wrap up. We're getting, getting kicked out, but I really appreciate it. Thanks for sharing the perspective. Great to see you again. Um, um, website, blog, you want to point to for folks that want to get involved in some of these awesome projects, because you know, sure. that's real life. I mean, changing life in society is part of the big data thing. We saw that with uh, Obama and, uh, coming on and talking about that. So any, any URL? Yeah, patternsandpredictions.com or just Google patterns and predictions or Chris Poole and Cloudera. <laughs> Chris, thanks for coming. I really appreciate it. This is theCUBE. We'll be right back uh, with a wrap up for day two after the short break. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned. I'm John with Jeff Kelly. Be right back.